Hey everyone, welcome back to Hour of History. This is your host, Stephen Bauman, and we have a delightful episode for you this week. Back in the studio is Travis Roy. Travis is a PhD candidate at Temple University studying history. Typically, he writes on the environment, but his work and his teaching experience talking about popular culture is fascinating and important, and it's excellent to have him as a guest. We have a great conversation, and I'm sure it's only one of many we're going to have because popular culture and history is a topic that needs much, much more discussion. It's very important. Plus, we didn't even talk about Star Wars that much, which I was kind of looking forward to. This episode is brought to you by Printful. Printful is easy on-demand online printing, fulfillment, and shipping. Just go to hourofhistory.com forward slash printful, P-R-I-N-T-F-U-L, to see all the various custom products you can choose from for you or your business. Mugs, sweatshirts, hats, swimwear, all that, and much, much more. Just go to hourofhistory.com forward slash printful now, and you can mock up merch with your own custom brand to sell from your store. So thanks again for joining us. Remember to subscribe and tell your friends about this excellent episode. It's a pleasure to have Travis Roy with us on Hour of History, where it's our world, anytime, any place. This is the Hour of History podcast. Our world, anytime, any place. And now from the Hour of History studio in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, your Hour of History starts right now. Hello, welcome to Hour of History. I'm your host, Stephen Bauman, and I'm here with Travis Roy. Hi. How's it going, Travis? Good, it's good to be back. It's good to be, it's good to have you back (laughs) here in Hour of History Studios. Uh, Last time we had a fascinating conversation about nature, Mm -hmm. but you are a man of many talents. I like to think so. So, uh, what, what do you have for us today? What, what are we going to talk about today? Uh, today we're going to discuss popular culture as a uh, avenue of historical inquiry. Popular culture as an avenue of historical inquiry. This is like, um, I'm already like going into like deep memory mode thinking about, I remember once a presentation in undergrad where someone came and, and gave a talk and was like, really, it's more about the analysis. You can study whatever you want. Sure. And so uh, that's what I think of when I hear popular culture. And What is popular culture? Well, that's, that's a good question, a good place to start. I mean, you also have to ask before even that, what is culture? Uh, right? So like... Um, uh-oh. <laughs> Warning lines. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we could descend into theory or we could sum up real quick. Um, culture being like a way that a society exhibits uh, values, behaviors, uh, that kind of thing through it, different mediums such as art and uh, sometimes it would be language or food, etc. So popular culture is a, is a, a shorthand way of saying like... Um, the fun stuff, right? Like the stuff that traditionally historians uh, disregarded as being fluff and not really relevant um, in a historical sense. Uh, I strongly disagree. I think that popular culture is a, is a great way to get at what people think about things from an era. People often will say how they feel about something. Um, but the success, say, of uh, Birth of a Nation... Uh, which I'll refer to probably later, but that that film, um, its success tells us something about the era that it came from and its popularity, or the enduring popularity of Gone with the Wind, for instance, will say something similar. So however people might uh, phrase their ideas, um, I think that they manifest better in uh, in, in art. So sometimes it's very open to interpretation, which you know, works from a historical standpoint. Right. So it's, it's very broad from the get go. Uh, I'm thinking like it could almost be anything in culture. Uh, Just about, I mean, I mean, cause I mean, especially if you think of like what's popular and what's not, that's such a, um, slippery slope. I mean, it, it, it tr- traditionally these kinds of studies started with, um, with analyses of mass culture, oh, okay. it, you know, like the commercially produced stuff intended for mass consumption. Uh, but most of that really, these things originate in 
small pockets and corners, usually urban areas, but not necessarily, and then become picked up and commodified by larger groups. So even like the even mass culture, air quotes, um, <laughs> is is going to be something that usually has a spontaneous uh, genesis. And so when you're thinking about studying culture in a historical way, uh, do is it like typical to get started with just something, a thing, a commodity, an action that you like, a piece of art? Or like, uh, do you find that it's typically, I study America and mm-hmm. there, I need to know the culture? I think, it, I mean, it can be both. I mean, let me tell you how I got it. Perfect. Um, aside from being like a pop culture junkie kind of anyways, which would make sense for me to go down that path, um, as discussed before, I tend to do environmental history, American environmental history. Um, what I ended up doing my master's thesis on was on the role of Walt Disney as a conservationist through film. I can't remember if I discussed this in the previous... No, no just briefly, yeah. Brief, briefly. Okay, so um, he did a... Well, Disney Studios, throughout the early 40s to the mid-60s or so, they paved their way, they paid their bills primarily by making a series of documentary films, nature documentary films, revolutionized nature documentaries as we know it. Um, I don't know how in-depth I should get into all this, but (laughs) there's a lot I could do there. But suffice to say that um, by the time I was in high school in uh, the 90s, we were still using uh, footage from Disney films that had been utilized in classrooms and colleges for decades. And it's it's a very, you know, anthropomorphized, sentimental approach to nature designed to uh, stir up sentiment Mm -hmm. to to support conservation. So a lot of Americans have their sense of how they feel about nature, especially in an era when, you know, physically we're more and more divorced from nature throughout Mm -hmm. the 20th century. Um, So we can get a sense of how people felt through looking at Disney films and their popularity, even though most people think Disney, they think of the cartoons now. Now, so it's, it's, it is essentially an unavoidable aspect of human life. It, there's Absolutely. cultural analysis. But how, in your study, how do you get focused on this, on this track? You know, how do you get deeper and deeper into it? Eventually, you have your own course, right? Yeah. Um, how does this happen for you? What, what paths did you follow to get deeper into the cultural analysis, popular culture specifically? Um, well, I started off just kind of just... Concentrating on cultural history is a more uh, vague and even more general kind of uh, of approach to things. So, um, but I think that usually ends up lending itself to be just becoming pop cultural history. So that that's part of it. And then my interest in environmental history, like as I just mentioned, kind of led to that. Um, and then I was assigned a, a pop culture course to teach a year ago, and I had heard it said that like teaching a course will like drastically reframe how you can approach history um, and what that and, and in teaching that course uh, I realized not only did I want to continue because I'd already been doing this kind of stuff anyways but I was kind of doing it on my own and kind of feeling kind of eh about it like I should be embarrassed around other historians like you know <laughs> um, you know I'm not doing real history but as, right. I, as I delved deeper into it I realized that it is prob- for in my view um it is one of the best ways, if not the best way, to get a sense of how Americans behaved, comported themselves, and felt about themselves. In particular, um, about race. Mm. I don't. I never set out to be one of those historians, and historians are frequently accused of trying to make everything about race, race. and boil things yeah. down to race. You know. Um, but as I learned about American history. Well before getting like you know in the, in the most basic levels in my undergrad and stuff, um, it came it became painfully obvious that America's uh, fascination slash ambiguity slash whatever uh, all of it it's, it's it's integral to to the to the American experience. And as I was teaching this course, uh, the pop culture course, again I didn't I did not set out to make it about uh, about race. Um, but there's no way not to look at American history and see instance after instance where specifically African Americans have either created something that has been repurposed for American purposes or um, were the subject of some sort of ridicule that has been 
uh, swept under the rug and forgotten despite its uh, enormous popularity for decades at the time sometimes. Uh-huh. Um, so it's a way of looking at the – sometimes it's the funner side and sometimes it's like the uglier side of American politics or American society. Can you put us into a time period or a frame that you can start this sort of analysis? Because I have a lot of questions I want to – ask about that absolutely but you presumably have to put up walls somewhere sure well it's actually a little bit easier with pop culture history to put those walls up chron- chronolo- chronologically chronologically speaking yeah to stumble that word out of my mouth <laughs> um, <laughs> no, the, our history is not necessarily advocating <laughs> wall building but uh, periodization <laughs> right I hope not um, so like for instance if you're looking at American history it's like where do we begin you know yeah, we yeah, start yeah. like in 1776 we start in 1492 etc uh, where do we begin but when it comes to pop cultural history it gets a little easier because so much of what pop cultural history is is a study of modernity uh-huh. you know, we're looking at the modern era so a lot of that just means looking at the 20th century for the most part. Um, we can go back further to celebrity figures, say, from even, like, um, the 1700s, such as uh, George Whitfield, who was this itinerant preacher during the Second Great Awakening, who uh, his pamphlets and his speeches, he toured America. He was from England, actually, but he was extremely popular here, and this was, like, one of our earliest quasi- Rock star level. Celebrities. Right, rock star <laughs> preacher man. Um, <laughs> or you can move forward a little bit in time to Sam Patch, who was a young man from, I want to say New York, uh, who was famous for throwing himself off of uh, the Niagara Falls in a barrel. That was like, he was the original barrel off the Niagara Falls kind of guy. I don't know if it was specifically Niagara Falls that he did. He did it in a a bunch of different places. Pre-Red Bull. Yeah. (laughs) And he was pretty much just a high jumper. I mean, that was the way he would just go to, he would go to uh, famous locations and and just jump off of them. And he was a nobody. And um, until he jumped. Until yeah, and, and, and that's what he became famous for. He became so famous that it became uh, like people used to say instead of like what the Sam Hell is going on here. People used to say like what the Sam Patch, that kind of stuff. Like his name became like this weird. Anyways, so yeah. so that's going further and further back. But it gets a lot easier to look at pop cultural history when you start getting into like after the advent of recording things. Yes, because then the dissemination dissemination of these things is made popular and that the purchase of those things is made popular or made possible and it's a lot easier to track that way. Right. So we're talking and this is how historians typically look at things is we need a a solid historical record from which we can, I mean there are other ways but so we're talking about like 20th century uh, and focusing on the United States but certainly you can go anywhere with this kind of stuff. Yes. Starting in the 20th century with, with firm roots in the 1800s because you have to look first at minstrel shows. Mm. Um, so just to, what minstrel show first of all just describe that what, what was why, and why is it a starting point so a starting point would be that um, minstrel shows would be a caravan of sorts and this goes back further than even the 1800s but it would be a means of like it would be a cart of some kind pulled around uh, and they got more and more elaborate but they, they could be something like a traveling circus just without the actual circus uh-huh. And it would be largely um, songs and jokes, or at least their versions of jokes. We would have been kind of unrecognizable yeah. to us today. Very firmly based in race-based humor. Um, Why is that? Good question. It uh, sold. Or... It sold. Yeah, huh. I mean, people. It attracted people. Um, it was not uncommon. In fact, it was the standard for for white people to appear in blackface and right. these kinds of things. Although that wasn't solely what they did. I mean, um, they would also be in other, like, fantastic, like, Uncle Sam costumes. There was different kind of things that they might be uh, dressed as. But largely it was uh, these things were socially acceptable, especially if you're looking at, like, um, Jim Crow America. This uh, the public ridicule of black people and black stereotypes and, and the reinforcement. Of this. The, my understanding of minstrel shows is like I don't know for maybe this is my own ignorance, but I always uh, associate them with the American South. Is it all over? Oh, they're absolutely everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um. So, and so there's this already race based humor. It sounds to me like a comedy circus type. Sort of. Yeah. Um. You, you know, and there's another thing we can kind of look at too in a similar way. Um. Something pop culture is great at is or the study of pop culture from a historical context is um 
it allows us to kind of piece together things that we have come to think of as being separate. Mm. A good example would be traveling metal medicine shows. Um, so during the minstrel era, there used to also be like these traveling metal medicine shows. And on a, on a medicine show, it would be a similar thing, like a, uh, some sort of caravan and you'd have, and it'd be like this confluence of medicine, uh, advertising and magic or at least mm. a belief in like the restorative properties of these things. You've heard the expression of like a snake oil salesman, that yeah. kind of stuff. Um, so you'd have, they, they, their, their job would be to like go to a small town, entertain people with their advertisement, uh, make preposterous claims more often than not, <laughs> and sell some item that was promised to do something that almost certainly it did not or could not do. Um, and we, you know, those, those things, uh, we may not think of those things as being connected now, the, the idea of advertising and medicine and magic, but of course they very much are. Yeah, sort right? of like a primordial health podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where people are going about... It, so there's a, a relative freedom of uh, information. This is before any sort of regulation, right? So people can kind of say oh, whatever yeah. they want. Yeah, before. I mean, this is before regulation. This is also, I mean, uh, before copyright laws. Ah. So for instance, uh, you would have songs... Throughout, uh, throughout, say, throughout the 1700s, there was maybe be like three or four tunes, but I mean, that's, that's an exaggeration, but there was not a lot of tunes that were highly, that were, um, there was just like a few that were very popular and then countless words and lyrics were set over these same tunes over and over and over again because there was, there was, there was no laws barring that kind right. of thing. Right. And that, and that's a tradition you very much see in, in country music in particular, um, the, the, passing around and trading of, of uh, songs and that kind of thing. Very interesting. So this continued march, so popular culture begins then with a uh, phenomenon that is traveling, it's moving around, and I imagine that culture is being shared then, or yeah. it's creating unity at some level. Absolutely. Um, uh, it, so, I mean, you have to look at also things like, as we got later into the 1900s, um, P.T. Barnum, mm -hmm. the traveling circuses, the Ringling Brothers, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then, of course, uh, va vaudeville in general. So va vaudeville is born from minstrel shows. Oh, okay. um, vaudeville being the, uh, at this point, when they actually start setting up like permanent studios, permanent buildings. Um, and there it would be a, a variety show. And there would be, um, you know, there would often be some form of burlesque thing. Cause it was very gendered, especially early on, these vaudevillian uh, locations. Is that because only the men are going out? Yeah. 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 Men are going out, men are drinking. Um, oh, so it's still the consumption that we kind of imagine at a ball game today type thing? Sort of, yeah. And, and there would be, and, and, and these places, I mean, there, there would be a big burlesque aspect to these vaudeville shows more often than not. Um, so you'd have dancing girls as things like the vitascope and different forms of imagery started, like, you know, different f forms of recorded moving pictures started showing up, those would also be implemented, again, very in a very pornographic kind of way. Yeah. Um, songs, a lot of, uh, again, a lot of racial jokes, that kind of thing. And there would be an MC in between whose job it was to kind of um, move things along and introduce people. And that's really where um, stand-up comedy as we know it comes from. Oh. With these original MCs. Like people like uh, Bob Hope, for instance, started off as, a, as an MC in, in vaudeville. Um, yeah, and then so it's just, fast forward. And, yeah, this is this constant growth. Um, one that I remember frequently, because I just visited the Museum of the uh, American Indian in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and they had this absolutely amazing exhibit about how it's sort of the, the popular culture growth of mm -hmm. basically the commodification of the Indian image, oh, yeah. the native image, and through Buffalo Bill's traveling show. Exactly. Very good example. Yeah. Um, and, and especially a good uh, 19th century example, like mm -hmm. Buffalo Bill. And again, like Buffalo Bill, um, he was best at, like a lot of these people that get famous, like P.T. Barnum. Or Donald Trump uh, are really good at self promotion. Yes, right? uh, the truth is kind of uh, uh, it's flexible for, for for types like like Buffalo Bill because um, so much of what he did was just about presenting a fantasy of the frontier West. Yes, and, and that's something that people are kind of starving for. Is that a theme of popular popular culture where people are? It's more of a reflection of the consumer almost. Absolutely. Um, you know, I would say that what, what the consumer is most driven by, and, and, and at least in my view, when I'm looking at pop culture, it always comes to this quest for authenticity. 
Uh, um, yeah. And usually it's authenticity presented in some sort of palatable, bite-sized, completely non-authentic kind of thing. <laughs> Right, but it's I mean, but that's 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 what you're trying to get. I mean, if we look at say um, the birth of blues, um, blues music. A lot of people when they trace blues, they'll start at someone like Lead Belly or um, or Robert Johnson, okay, who are classic early recorded um, blues musicians. But by the time those guys started to gain popularity. They were really just gaining popularity in white culture. They were already kind of old hat uh, in, um, in African American culture. They, they, were, they were already like they were more embracing people like Ma Rainey and some other folks. Who by the time and Sun House is another fine example. By the time blues started to become popular in white cult- culture, in, in part fomented by this guy named Alan Lomax, who was like going out of his way to like dig up folksy characters uh, and uh, and record them. Yeah. Uh, it was hard, like African Americans were already moving on to like jazz and bebop. So as that stuff was getting on the radio, people in white America was like, "Oh, this is so rootsy and earthy." And like you know, there's there's this fascination with the poor, with the uh, disenfranchised, with uh, the you know people that are challenged, that kind of stuff. And and so white people were drawn to blues in an attempt to like uh, pluck some of that authenticity. And, and apply it to their to their own selves. I think. Is it, it now? Why was there a separation in the creation of pop culture? So you know, there's different things coming out of different communities. Is it because there's not like how come we don't see a uniform American popular culture? How come you see these transitions between like African Americans to is it why isolation segregation? What is the reason that causes these different patterns? Because I asked this, and I hope we can get there eventually. Is uh, the way we the, where we arrive today in Netflix, where you know everyone is tuned into their own likes on Netflix mm-hmm. to a point where yours and mine might look totally different. Right. Well, I mean, I think that's one of the things that's got like there. Yeah, there will be. There never has been, and there certainly will not be the way things are going. A uniform American popular culture. Right. And that's not really. I think that the you know the closest we can get to that kind of thing is if we look at say. Uh, the early 60s, late 50s fascination with people like um, the Rat Pack, like Frank, like Frank Sinatra and, 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 and Dino and, uh, and, and Jerry Lewis. But even then, like that stuff is coinciding with some, some very cool, very hip, which is not to say that the Rat Pack is a cooler hip, <laughs> but um, underground kind of uh, things that were, you know, bubbling up. So what's, what, the only thing that can create this this uh, fantasy of a unified popular culture will be like con- like oversaturation mm-hmm. or control of, like a limited resource or limited ways of, of viewing the material. Let me, let me give you a good example. Um, so Frank Capra and Jimmy Stewart are kind of struggling to reassert themselves after World War II in Hollywood culture. And both of them look at this film that they're working called working on called It's a Wonderful Life as a chance for them to kind of like reclaim their status because they both kind of had gone away for the war or had gotten involved in other things during the war. Um, and the movie came out and it was viewed as, as maudlin, as kind of sappy. Uh, it didn't do great. It didn't flop, but it didn't do great. Mm-hmm. Um, but what did end up happening is that Less than about 18 years later, after it was released, I want to say in '73, there is this clerical error, and the movie accidentally enters the public domain. Mm. And so NBC, ABC, CBS, which at this time, you know, these are these were it. These were your only options. These three stations started showing the film not just around Christmas time, but like throughout the year, just like, hey, this is a decent movie. Let's just show it all the time. Um, flash forward a few more years. The studio gets the rights back. Only NBC has rights to show this film. They show it once a year at Christmas. Uh, Standard. Uh A very similar thing happened with Casablanca. Yeah. Casablanca, obviously a a good movie. Right. But it was it was published and shown and re-shown on on television, uh, you know, broadcast television for an entire generation of people when they had a a far more limited option. So clearly, it's going to create much more um, affection 
in the psyche for something like that. Yeah. So, so, so the consumption is if it's like, you know, put through one small, uh, pathway, then it goes out to more people. Right. But over time, obviously these channels of, of, Open up. of, of consumption have diversified drastically to where we're all just picking and choosing how we, um, how and, we get our, but along our racial country. lines, how does that happen? Um, what do you, um, what like, do you like I'm saying, like, as far as like jazz, you know, originating in the African American community mm -hmm. before being like so co opted. I mean, I guess we can get into the dreaded cultural appropriation discussion, sure. and I hope too. Um, but how does it, how does that process work? How does something start in one place and transform, and why don't we see it? Like, why do we see it that way? Okay, so, so jazz, for instance, yes. it formed in a, in a couple of locations primarily. Um, New Orleans and New York were the main sources of, of jazz's eruptions. So you have, you have different kind of styles of jazz coming from these two different regions. Um, and basically these, these areas, these, these cities, uh, they start their own scenes with people like uh, Dizzy Gillespie and Louis Armstrong, you know, getting footholds in their local populace, like in, in the people that enjoy their music you know it makes sense you right. play for your crowd yeah right and it, it, you start getting they started getting more and more popular and very soon um you know white people start going to these all uh, black clubs they you know so white clubs were discriminatory whites only black clubs anyone was welcome uh -huh. but more often than not it would just be black people so um jazz kind of introduced the idea of what they call black and tan clubs where where, where white usually like city going suburb or like upper whatever like white white collar kind of uh type started hanging out looking for this authenticity so trying they, to share this experience in these in the darker corners of the city um the early hipsters right you know they, they, they're like this is the grungy side of things this is like this is where the real music comes from. real and yeah. so as that starts okay. and, and as that start and it starts building in popularity of course it starts you know people start sniffing around for money to record them and before you know it people like louis armstrong are going on these global tours to like present jazz to foreign nations as a means of like uh like is a, is a form of being an ambassador to, to other nations. It's almost like present, uh, performing Americanness abroad. Right. Well, yeah, the, the whole goal with those things was trying to convince people that there were no racial problems in America during uh -huh. the Cold War. Look at look at how famous people like Louis Armstrong are, um, you know, pay no attention to the segregation. And like they can kind of become millionaires and they can make their money in this way. Yeah, I mean, d depending. I the pre-millionaire era. Yeah, they can make a living doing yeah. this sort of thing. It depended. I mean, um, I mean, black people in particular were singled out for, uh, a, a, especially in like Motown and early kind of uh, that kind of recording. They were often precluded from getting their own royalties. That kind of mm. thing, just through. So a lot of people had to suffer um, before laws were passed to make sure that like uh, proprietorship was, you know. I'm not sure if that's a word I want to use, <laughs> but that the, the people's intellectual property is, is, is stays with them. Yeah. So we and we've been kind of uh, touching around this issue. The issue of copyright and intellectual property yeah. seem pretty central to the the spread of popular culture. Definitely. What 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 time period does this sort of emerge? Like, where is this coming to us? You know, late, later than you would think. Um, probably like around like so, Tin Pan Alley. Uh, like the 30s, I want to say 30s, 40s, this kind of stuff starts coming, becoming more of an issue. Um, and again, it, it kind of depended on where, on which genre you were looking at. Like mm. country music was slower to concern itself with this kind of thing. Um, Interesting. But yeah, largely around that. Area. Because it seems to me that copyright in a lot of ways would slow down the mass replication of these kind of things. Especially in an era when you can't just, you know, send a movie everywhere. Sure. Yeah, it, it did. It did, uh, yeah. but um, but not necessarily for the worst, right? I mean, like people need to make a living, right? And it, <laughs> and it helped people make money. But uh, okay, so then at the same time, uh, do you have in the record like people who are refusing to make these transitions, like Louis Armstrong, to a global hit? Are there people who kind of stick around, or do they just uh, they're deleted from the record, kind of thing? Well, I mean, I don't know if that they're necessarily gonna like ref like. Um, resist in that sense, but I, I, okay. So, 
So Louis Armstrong, I'm, I'm using as an example here of, of, of jazz ambassadorship, where he would yeah. was, was used as a diplomat by um, by Americans, by the American government. Mm-hmm. In contrast, you have someone like Paul Robeson, who um, very famous baritone, he may even sing bass, very deep, beautiful uh-huh. voice. I don't know if you ever heard him sing. Yeah. Actor, uh, extremely talented man, um, with very strong, especially after he visited uh, Russia, very strong communist sympathies. Mm. And he was very vocal about his support for Russia and communism um, up, upon upon coming back from Russia for the first time. He felt like there he was not treated to the discrimination that he was treated in his home country. Uh, and he started traveling the world, uh, Scotland, all over the place, um, acting as an advocate for like workers' rights, mm. that kind of stuff. This made him extremely unpopular with the government. They revoked his visa, and he was no longer able to travel. Um, so they, they silenced his voice as best as they could. And Paul Robeson, he dominated uh, much of his his time. And we're looking at, they're talking about, ooh, God, like I want to say the 1940s or so. Yeah. Um, but his name is not remembered the way that, say, Louis Armstrong's could be and should be. He was, I mean, he was extremely influential. Yeah, I talked a little bit about that with Tamir Sorek about the the protests for football players. How, like, it's it, for a long time, it was not economically beneficial for them, or they would lose their livelihood if they mm-hmm. spoke out. So that it seems like it's similar in popular culture. You have to toe the line. Um, to, in order to not only not be shut down, but also to gather enough support. Uh, can you talk a little bit about like the growth of nationalism? And maybe we'll get into movies here. Um, or, or maybe not the, necessarily the growth of nationalism, but just towing the line in order to gain favor. Or how do, they, how do these things become popular? You mean towing the line like in terms of like placating the government? Yeah, I'm talking about like working with the government or working in a way, working, um, playing into the popular opinion rather than creating art, maybe. Well, I mean, you could, you could do both. And to get back to Frank Capra, that's what he was doing during World War II. Like there was an actual office in the army that was, I, I think it was called like the Office of Propaganda or something similar to that, where he, they were unabashedly making propaganda films. And the films that he made, um, they're under a series called Why We Fight, were beautiful films. I mm. mean, just well made, uh, and they won multiple Academy Awards for documentaries and that kind of stuff. So he was creating actual art that resonated with people. Um, with the direct and intentional purpose of swaying their their mindset politically, so that kind of stuff would be would be one way of going about doing that. And that was was that based on his own uh, political views, or was he sort of coerced into doing that? Because... No, I think he was pretty sincere okay. in in his uh, approach there. I mean, he was. Yeah, I think it would be crazy. And like I've read, you know, I've read about like superhero films and things like that being used as ways of bolstering American identity. Um, sure. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, I mean, the number one place to start would be with Superman, right? Yeah. Um, and and funnily enough, it probably wouldn't be with Superman, the comic book, that really um, launched that character into the national psyche as like a symbol of Americanism as it would be the, the, the original TV show that was based off of the comic book, uh, starring George Reeves. Um, so that, you know, that comic came out and, and, and it was, I think I want to say 1936 and, um, superheroes as we knew them did not exist yet as we know them now. I mean, like, they, like so who were the heroes? <laughs> there, there weren't, I mean, wow. it, was, it was comic books prior to Superman were very much um, usually, I mean, they were heroes, but they were, they were Westerns. Uh, okay, a lot yeah. of gunplay, or a ton of them would be um, like these big monsters. So like, it would be like a, a, some sort of comic book, and there would be a big monster attack. And, and we still have heroes left over from that era, like the Incredible Hulk. Was, uh-huh. It was originally like a Marvel monster, as was Groot from the uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. So, um, but I, I, I diverge. No, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so... The, the superhero uh, of Superman became like a template for many that came after. DC became ex- extremely popular. Marvel was behind and, and very consciously trying to emulate DC and became a much more superior provider <laughs> of content, in uh-huh. my humble opinion. Um, but yeah, so it, it was just uh, kind of like a, uh, 
uh, yeah, a template of, of what a, a, a superhero, a super person can be. And a lot of times what you had in those cases, okay, so the people that, the, the, the two guys that created Superman were, um, were a couple of uh, Jewish guys from New York. Um, one of their fathers had been murdered, and his and the murderer was never found. Classic the other guy trope. Was, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, for a reason. And the <laughs> other guy was like was pretty scrawny, and um, and they kind of like and using in part the idea of like the Superman theory from Nietzsche. They they the, the Ubermensch that kind of mm-hmm. thing. Um, they came up with this character that actually ended up being more like the villain. Um, who I'm blanking on. Lex Luthor. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, the, the original incarnation of Superman. But uh, they created this character and it was a way for them to kind of instill their ideas into it. Uh-huh. Flash forward a little bit to Jack Kirby and Stan Lee. Um, Jack Kirby was a, was, a, was a Jewish guy, a creative guy, who saw the, what was going on in the 1930s, not just in Germany, but like in America. People forget that, that, that Nazis had a surprising amount of support in America leading up to the war, uh, including like in New York City, that kind of stuff, to the point that Kirby and, and Lee had to, after introducing the character of Captain America, who on the front cover of the, the first one issue, he's punching Adolf you know, Hitler in the face. They, they had to, yeah, they had to get uh, armed guards to surround the building of Timely Comics, which it used to be called Timely before it was called Marvel. And um, like, have bodyguards because Americans <laughs> were so upset with them for daring to um, to make a political to message. make that kind of political message about 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 Nazism Be- because this was well before a good year or two before um, America entered itself into the war. So it was an avenue, it was a, an opportunity for Kirby and Lee to like, here's what we should be doing. You know, like, it, it, superheroes are a great opportunity to present like the best in us or what we want the best in us to be, which of course is always a shifting thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, does that have to be No, yeah, it does. But uh, the, this, I'm kind of fascinated now with this idea of Captain America as like, as a just invention. I mean, that's kind of an extraordinary thing already, but um, who's paying for this? Are they like, is this like a low budget operation oh, that yeah. gets big? Right. How does it work? So, I mean, DC Detective Comics started out doing actual detective comics. So there was the super the, 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 before superheroes, it would have been westerns and like uh, kind of film noir, pulp fiction kind of stuff. Yeah, the detectives, um, some romance stuff. So these publications already existed. DC in particular, Timely was trying was trying to compete with DC. Eventually, Stanley thought Marvel's a better name. He tried Atlas as well, I think. Oh, um, yeah, went through a few. <laughs> But um, but they were they were both struggling, but with the popular like Superman just took off. I mean, he t- I, 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 it's not one hundred percent honest to say that Superman didn't take off until uh, the, the the TV show. That the, the TV show he entered everybody's homes. Yeah. Um, but the but Superman originally and a little bit later Captain America and the Human Torch and Vision and some other folks. Um, they became extremely popular in, in the burgeoning teenage market. So this, this stuff really co- uh, coincided with like the, the, po- the growing popularity of what they then would have called like teen music or rock and roll. Oh. Uh, so all of a sudden... <laughs> young kids. Yeah. So like dem- this is like a period when demographics are becoming important to advertisers and, and to corporations. And they're starting to like niche advertising and like trying to zero in on specific interest groups and that kind of stuff. So uh, the popularity of, of someone like Superman or Captain America uh, was a boon to these tiny publications. And, you know, they just grew from there. And in the case of Marvel in particular, they were very much infused with, like, these kind of liberal ideologies, which made them resonant amongst youth and, like, college culture. So, yeah, and so it's already a massive cultural shift that's happening when these are being published. Right. Um, that's kind of extraordinary. The, while you're saying this, I'm thinking now and still thinking about the authenticity kind of thing that we talked about. Yeah. Um, I don't want to get too off. I like the historical narrative, but I have to ask. Oh, yeah. We live now in the age of the superhero film. Like there are mm-hmm. so many I haven't seen of any. them. Are you good? Really? I'm totally kidding. I'm <laughs> <laughs> 
I was going to say, oh my god. Except for the Sony Studios ones, though, thank you. That in its, oh, yeah. uh, message there. <laughs> How does a, does a guy who knows all the history of this kind of stuff approach these films like that are becoming um, like like a culture wars you know oh so like when you go to these films yeah. what are you seeing are you are you thinking about the historical um very honestly no i am not i mean I, whether i'm going to see those movies the first time i'm just kind of letting it wash over me like a viewer yeah um, but i but in retrospect i will often approach them that way especially uh, when i think of characters like I've, I've looked at captain america a lot and that's partly why i I, 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 I value him in particular is because of the uh, the ethos that he's been able to instill in generations of Americans, like the um, that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, the films themselves these days, well, it's not just Marvel films, right? I mean, almost any everything's so politicized now. Um, Star Wars is extremely politicized now as well. Yeah, and I think that historically, you know, something. I mean, again, like I was just talking about with the the. Captain America punching Hitler across the face was weirdly controversial <laughs> for some people when it came out. Well, that sounds so pretty shooting. politicized to us. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, so that resonated. Like there were some people that were like, "Hell yeah, like, get him, get him," you know, and like we're very excited about this kind of stuff. And there were other people that were appalled. Just like now, there are some people that are going to watch a movie and be like, "Oh, that film represents both gender or all genders," I should say. Uh, or and other people will, will watch that movie and you know. All, all they see is SJWs, etc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what? Yeah, let's get into that. Uh, is is that uh, is this something that we see throughout popular culture? A continuous uh, molding of characters, or is it absolutely sinful if James Bond becomes a woman? Like, <laughs> is is this something that you've seen in the study of popular culture? Is it a changing thing, or do people remain loyal to their myths throughout? I don't think that people necessarily remain loyal to their myths so much as they'll change the characters to adapt to the, the circumstances. Like Captain America uh, at one point becomes uh, like virulently anti-communist and uh, is like beating up like hippies and stuff when, when in, the, in like the 1950s. Uh, you know, another point he's like, uh, I mean, he, he goes through some, some strange kind of versions and, and, and most, most has. So, which is another reason why pop culture, I think, is, is of value. You can, if you look at someone like Superman or, or Captain America over time, you can track what was culturally appropriate, what was culturally acceptable, and, and what kind of envelopes are being pushed or reinforced. So do we lose that now that culture is much more spread out? Like now we don't have just three channels. I can watch whatever I want on TV. Are we losing some of the, uh, I don't know, historical viability? I, I mean, I don't know about historical viability. I mean, it's a, maybe a little, it's going to be a little harder for future historians to track. On one hand, it might be, but on the other hand, it might be even easier. You know, I mean, um, if you if there's just all this stuff going on out there, and someone's looking at, at say uh, 2018 in the future, and they're looking, there's there's just a, a, an overload of of art and cinema and that kind of stuff, and then. What they would see, one of the things they would see is the is Childish Gambino's video for This Is America. Like, that's going to rise to the top because it was such a cultural moment. Mm -hmm. like, I mean, I remember the day it came out, like, oh, everybody at once was like, holy crap, look at this video. Yeah. Um, so, so there is going to be stuff like that or like maybe like Stranger Things that just kind of, like these things that rise and people are, um, you know, it's going to be... It's going to be imprecise, you know. Unlike when people looked at when people look at the fifties, they can look at the honeymooners or whatever and say, "Oh, everyone's watching this." But um, it's going to be a little harder in the future, but because I mean, there's going to be a lot of things that will slip between the cracks. But yeah. you'll get a good sense. Like, yeah, like I so I've noticed. I always do informal polls in the classroom. I'm tr constantly trying to like say, you know, have you seen this movie? Because just to make connections between the material yeah. that we talk about and the only. <laughs> The only show that every student in the last two years has seen is Stranger Things. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. No other show. I, for, I, uh, as someone who prides himself on pop culture, when it comes to the classroom, I, I try to refrain <laughs> from making pop culture references because I can only be so disappointed when my Big Lebowski quotes fall flat. And I can only do it so many times. Before I'm like, oh yeah, like these people have never seen Columbo. I can't make a reference yeah. to that show. <laughs> yeah, but is this uh, this is a feature of pop culture throughout? Is it not true? Oh, absolutely. I mean, because pop culture is very much well. 
I mean, it's a good way of, of uh, looking at generational cohorts. Uh. What, what matters to one generation, you can kind of track that over time, too, because they're going to continue to have kind of similar tastes, right? Like, um, uh, what can I think of? Well, even the Westerns, that seems to be stuck in a certain era and sure. then repurposed and it re yeah, invented. I mean, we have now Westworld, you know, which is <laughs> essentially a Western. Oh, yeah. Western sci-fi. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, Western is a, is a great place to look because, I mean, if you look at it, say, in its height of popularity, the John Wayne days, that kind of stuff, I mean, you have Rock Hudson playing an Indian. You have um, you have virtually no American Indians playing, playing Indians. Mm -hmm. um, you have the white guys always as the protagonists, right? Um, you have a very... De definite reinforcement of like masculine values and like gender roles and that kind of stuff. That's that's all the 1950s, and you know that that goes on for a while, and then the genre more or less falls out of favor completely. It becomes um, something you know a very very rarely will you have like it will be something like the Django films in the 70s that kind of stuff, or it becomes more like pulp pulp stuff, mm -hmm. and then it gets reinvented with I would say um, Unforgiven is a is a main point the of film Unforgiven Rebirth yeah um, where I mean you had Silverado and Tombstone and some other stuff before that which started introducing these darker elements and more nuanced and complicated characters but westerns now you go and watch them now and they're um, they're these great places to play with uh, relative morality hmm. and um, and that kind of thing so like those kind of traditional what it used to be has changed very much uh, the white guy is seldom the good guy now. Um, so much of the films, this, again, like looking at Clint Eastwood films, so much of the films in the past would have been uh, very pro-Confederacy, mm -hmm. uh, you know, perpetuating the myth of the lost cause getting into the, into the 70s again. Uh, you're not likely to see that now. You're instead going to get Django Unchained or um, 310 to Yuma, something a little bit darker. So is, is that like... Uh like people are saying we're in this moment of division. Do you see that as a historical? Because I see the debates about Star Wars going, you know, online. Should this character, the woman commander or whatever. Should a woman be allowed in Star Wars? Basically, question, right? more or less. And, and, uh, but it sounds like this has been going on for a while. Yes, absolutely. So it's a constant debate. This is not a special culture war we're entering. Definitely not. This uh -huh. debate has always taken place, but like everything, it's exacerbated and more in our faces now because of social media. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone's opinion is just out there. And not only is everyone's opinion out there, so are all the bots and the people who's whatever, for whatever reason, like I, like Venom came out last week. Yes. I have not seen it. Um, but I have seen like the same tweet from like 16 different people word for word that was designed to bash it from like these a bunch of different bots. For whatever reason, there is a campaign trying to undermine, undermine the success of this film. I don't know why. It looks bad on its own. To be <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so you're, so not only are we getting everyone's opinion, we're getting these very tampered with and, uh, you know, adulterated opinion. And with the veil of anonymity, too. So right. people are not afraid to say uh, just truly horrible things. Right. And that person that says something truly horrible might have seven, eight, nine accounts right. where they're going to say something truly horrible. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's going to be, it's hard, it's hard to get a good sense of for those reasons. Which, again, will make it very difficult for future historians. I kind of sometimes wonder, like, how things will go if and when the internet just collapses completely <laughs> and, and all that's left is the written record. It'd be so much easier for future oh, historians, but they won't know anything. Yeah. <laughs> and if it disappears, even that, like, it would become perplexing, the sort of... Oh, my, it'd be like a dark age in terms of history. I mean, people would have a really hard time keeping track of, of what happened during <sighs> this span of time. Man, yeah, it's... It, I think, yeah, I think people tend to fall into this over just getting into it too much. The current sort of debate on each kind of movie. Sure. Um, but I also feel out of the loop because I don't consume movies mm -hmm. as much. Do you, what do you see as like the people outside of, are there people outside of pop culture? Is it like how, no, no, no you have to be in it. Everyone's, everyone, I mean, <sighs> You know, I've met people who are like, oh, I don't really like music. I don't really care. And you're like, what is wrong with you? What did you say? 
<laughs> but even they, like on their own, like they're, like they're they're still gonna like they're still they have their five or six songs or whatever they like. They have that one Leonard Skinner album that they go to when they're feeling feisty. You know, I mean, everyone has like something. Um, I can think of like I, I can think of someone in my life who's much older who. Um, you know, pretty much all of the entertainment they get comes through Fox News. Right. Um, but even still, like, they, they, will, they will still have, like, they have their collection of DVDs. They can throw on What About Bob or whatever film from the 90s or 70s that resonates for them. Yeah. And so it may, you know, so everyone at some level is going to have some exposure to pop culture. It's whether, like whether an, they in, in, embrace it the way I do or not. An inescapable facet of life. Well, because it's, because at its heart, it is a, a mean. It is, I mean, it's two things. It's art, yeah. But it's also like a vehicle of capitalism, right? Yes. Like it, it's it's consumption. It's 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 ever present as anything else that we're going that that we're that's in the ether that that we're going to consume or that's around us. I mean, try to get through a, a, a fifty year span on, on, of life on Earth now without seeing the Coca Cola logo whether you ever drink Coca-Cola or not. It's impossible. Right. And do you see the trend? Uh, do you see the production as, I mean, it seems like it's proliferating at an even greater speed and level now. Like I remember uh, just, I liked, you know, like hockey as a child. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there would be like one or two movies. Like I couldn't see Slapshot because it was rated R for a long time. And then I finally saw Slapshot and I was like, Wow, but that was the only hockey movie. But now on Netflix, you know, they have Slapshot spinoffs and they have Miracle and the whole franchise. Was, yeah. Who saw that coming? I did not. Um, so is this like a, a capitalism, you know, it's just going to keep reproducing so long as there's consumers? Uh, do you see this as a good thing for popular culture or were there really a golden day of popular culture when we all had to watch three channels? I, I definitely don't think there was some sort of golden day of anything. <laughs> there never was a, a true historian. <laughs> yeah, only yeah, only a non-historian would think that. To be honest, to make a kind of pretentious statement. Yeah, um, but, <laughs> yeah the regular people would say oh, the hoi polloi. <laughs> um, no, but honestly, I mean that kind of mindset is is it's, it's pure nostalgia. It's uh, and, and, and nostalgia is tied up with the whole search for authenticity, right? That doesn't exist. You're always looking backwards for something that you remember as being there. there there's no golden age. Of 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 uh, of popular culture, I mean, let me think of someone who's been around for a very long time. <laughs> Punch and Judy, are you familiar with Punch yeah, and Judy? Yeah. I mean, they're medieval. They're those those puppets have been around since the medieval ages, and someone today could repurpose Punch and Judy, and I could just I could imagine like some sort of Adult Swim show where it's just like it'd probably be awesome. Yeah. Um, or you know, a, a reboot. Yeah, a reboot. I, I mean, there have been multiple reboots of everything already, and I think that will continue to go on. I mean, some things will phase out and be utterly forgotten. And then I imagine, like, Star Wars, for instance, will probably become a whole new thing 40, 50 years from now or less. Um, and does this does this only work because they're working off of old human myths? Is, yeah. Is popular, <laughs> popular culture is just old stories being retold and retold? Not, not always. I mean, it's both, right? So on one hand, like, we want new Captain America stories. We want new Star Wars stories. We want, we want these things retold with familiar characters. On the other hand, we look to these corners of our society um, and for instance um, looking in California where the skater scene started to emerge in the very late 60s early 70s like that that stuff was going on on its own completely uh, untampered with its own scene created um, until it kind of caught on in the 90s early 2000s skating becomes downright mainstream uh, and now today, 2018, I see people on a daily basis wearing a Thrasher t-shirt, yeah. who I'm sure have no idea what Thrasher is. Uh, so, so yeah, some things are going to stay, some things are going to go, I think. Yeah, that's kind of, but, but there is a, this human uh, myth. Yeah, I mean, part, part of it's going to be the drive for nostalgia, but also, I, I kind of lost my thread there. Yeah, yeah. But it's also going to be the um, the search for new things, uh -huh. where I was trying to go with that. Like, um, dubstep excited a lot of people not me personally but it excited a lot of people five ten years ago yeah and um and it was everywhere you went for a minute and now you're gonna have like these dubstep step enthusiasts and most people will forget about it. like ska in the early mid 90s um you couldn't hardly go anywhere without seeing a ska reference that kind of stuff 
And now, you know, there's, you're still going to find some 13-year-old ska fan out there. but And that somewhere out there, there's people that are creating entirely new forms of music. I mean, it, it gets harder and harder, say, to create a new genre of film. But there's new ways of doing it over and over again that sometimes become routine. That, right? that make it seem newer than perhaps it is. Yeah, look at, um, like, uh, handheld faux documentary style movies or, or TV shows. So you take, like... Bellini is like the classic place to look, but I, I prefer to look at Rob Reiner's uh, uh, spot. This is Spinal Tap as a as a place for like uh, faux documentary comedies. Yeah, and now with things like Modern Family or The Office or Parks and Rec, like it's this, become this very style, big again. Yeah, this style is just. I mean, it's like a, a given, right? It's still relatively new, but it's redone, redone in different kind of ways. If you seem exciting. Well, what about the globalization? How is like global That's taste changing the consumption? Of popular culture. Well, Transformers movies still exist, for instance. <laughs> They're still putting out new Transformers movies, yeah. despite the fact that they flop utterly in the U.S. Yeah. But in China, they do very well. So you you will start to have shows or movies that uh, are going to have, especially if you're dealing with like big action picks or um, animation where you can easily flub the, the, the voiceovers, that kind of stuff. You start ending up with, uh, with shows and movies with... with Appeal so broad that they become distilled to almost nothing, right? Yeah. Um, but that's that's partly the effect of globalization. You, you you try just like anything. Like if you try and hit a broad audience, usually it's going to fall flat. You try to hit a global audience, you have a very finely <laughs> polished turd. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and and that seems I've noticed in the films they start sneaking in more uh, Chinese settings, oh Chinese God, yes. backgrounds. Oh, oh yeah. it's becoming so so apparent. Yeah, every every movie has this Hong Kong scene or maybe like a Seoul scene. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah, because that's where the consumption. That's interesting, and that's that capitalist force driving absolutely the art that yeah, you kind of mentioned. Yeah. So even if you're looking at so in the future, if you're looking at say Black Panther. Uh, as a as a means to try and get how Americans or the world felt about like African Americans or something like that, you'd still be able to be like, oh, look at how they're very purpose like you know <laughs> what, you, what you just described, like trying to set up uh, audiences for their- yeah, that's pretty interesting. Um, yeah, we're drawing close to the end. Uh, it um, always goes so fast. I know it does, and, and there's a lot of things I want to ask. Maybe if I have to, you know, narrow it, I want to ask of how this involves America because this seems to be with Hollywood a powerful export of the United States oh my God. that doesn't seem to be matched elsewhere absolutely not I mean it's just not uh, it's it's bizarre our, our cultural overreach it's it's um, it's our strongest power as a, as a country uh, our and and what's funny is that what usually is being passed around especially these days, or even going back to the 60s, a lot of the stuff that, that gets more popular tends to have fairly progressive um, underlying themes. So that kind of stuff resonates with, with, with audiences. Yeah, I think, it's, I think we're going to continue to do that, especially at this point as we wane as a global power, as, a, as, as, as we wane as, uh, as a global leader. Uh, I think our, our, our culture is going to get even more important but hopefully not more watered down. And I think that we can continue. I mean, like, China has, is starting to release big blockbuster movies in a similar style. I mean, Bollywood obviously has been doing that for a long time. So we don't dominate the entire globe. But I think it's only a matter of time before we start seeing more a global. Like, Netflix, for instance, is picking up a lot of other, like, Indian shows. Uh, Norwegian shows and, and repurposing them for American audiences. I think we're going to see a lot more of that as we lose our status in the, in the globe. Interesting. Um, it's time for the final. We're finishing the show. The time for the recommendation. Uh, what do you have for us, Travis? Uh, it's not out yet, but there's an album coming out by a band called Young Jesus. I would recommend anything by Young Jesus. They're the best band ever. Wow, fantastic. Uh, I am going to recommend, we didn't talk about it much, but I do recommend that you go back and check out some nature documentaries by Disney. Hopefully Travis can give me some links I can put sure, in yeah. the show notes at ourofhistory.com. True Life Adventures. True Life Adventures. Yeah, that is what we call a stolen, repurposed recommendation. <laughs> I'm taking an idea right, works. he mentioned. But once again, thank you for joining us, Travis Roy. Always a pleasure. It's great to be here. On Hour of History, it's our world, anytime, any place.
Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to check out our recommendations page at ourhistory.com forward slash rex. That's ourhistory.com forward slash R-E-C-S. There you'll find links to the books mentioned during the podcast. And if you choose to purchase one, you'll be supporting the podcast in the process. And if you still haven't gotten your fill of the Hour of History, make sure you head over to the Hour of History blog found at hourofhistory.com forward slash blog with articles being released fairly often on topics relating to those covered in the podcast as well as others. With that, we conclude this episode and hope to have you back for the next one. Take care. And again, thanks for listening to the Hour of History podcast.